purpose and our sense of authority that we have to bring heaven to earth, the sense that God has not just wants us to wait for us to go to heaven, but he wants us to have the authority and power to serve him now to bring his kingdom into this world. So uh, we're going to continue that series. I'm going to hand over to Bev. Welcome, Bev. in just a few weeks. Yeah. (laughs) So, tonight we're on this same subject of authority and service, but the particular task that I'm looking at this evening is the authority and anointing to fulfill Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, which of course you'll all remember if you've got that. So the prophet Isaiah, one of our favorites, he spoke of the Messiah coming, the Savior who would come, with the anointing of God to bring good news to the earth. And Isaiah, whose name means God is salvation, prophesied this about 700 years before Jesus was born. And the prophecy declared the favor of God on his captive people and his anger against their enemies. And this is very similar to the word that we've had recently. God gave us at the start of 2017 that this would be a year of fulfillment of his promises and victory over enemies. So, on one significant occasion when Jesus was passed the Holy Scriptures to read in the synagogue, he was given Isaiah's prophecy and he read aloud to all those gathered. And we pick up this story of him reading this prophecy of Isaiah in Luke 4. And you can read that if you like. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. I like that. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood's home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus only quoted the first three verses of Isaiah 1, stopping at the point of declaring God's favor. But he was clearly stating that after 700 years, the prophecy was being fulfilled through him. He is the Messiah we have been waiting for so long. And with Jesus' fulfillment came a huge measure of freedom for God's people that went far and above anything they'd ever imagined when Isaiah first prophesied. When Isaiah prophesied, it was believed that the sent one would bring an end to their exile. They were in exile from 597 to 538 BC. And so they were awaiting freedom from their captivity so they could move and worship freely. And so when this message came from Isaiah, they believed it would be like a jubilee. They understood jubilee. It was when every 50 years, slaves and prisoners were freed, debts were forgiven, land and property was returned, and God's great mercy was expressed. Leviticus 25, 8 to 10 says it like this. And they must count off seven Sabbath years, seven sets of seven years, adding up to 49 years in all. Then on the day of atonement in the 50th year, blow the ram's horn loud and long throughout the land. Set this year apart as holy, a time to proclaim freedom throughout the land to all who live there. It will be jubilee for you when each of you may return to the land you belong to your ancestors and return to your own family. So Isaiah's jubilee star message was an absolute good news to them after they were held in captivity and bondage in Babylon. They understood the prophecy at that time to mean God's liberation from their oppressors and freedom to return to their homeland. Then Jesus declared himself the Messiah. He had something far greater in mind than they saw. Through him, there was not only the promise of physical freedom for a generation, there was freedom from all the effects of sin and death over all their generations. His jubilee offers layer after layer of freedom, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and eternally for all who would receive him. 
And this is made clear as Jesus states that he's anointed and sent in order to redeem and heal every consequence of sin. We know that sin and poverty makes us poor. It breaks hearts. It oppresses. It imprisons. But Jesus is anointed to restore and bring good news to the physically poor, the emotionally poor, described as the brokenhearted and the crippled, and the oppressed, all those crushed in spirit. And Jesus is coming. He doesn't just set physically exiled and imprisoned people free. His salvation and deliverance sets anyone trapped in darkness, sin, pain or despair free. All find comfort as ears and eyes are opened to the revelation and the vision of Jesus. This is a three-way restoration, body, soul and spirit, and not just temporarily, but for all eternity. But the result of Jesus fulfilling his life and mission is true freedom to love, serve and worship God. Worship in those means showing God his work, worship is what God comes for. Suffering that the exiled people of God haven't been able to do on their own. They've longed to do it for centuries, but were prevented from doing it on their own. Sometimes with people who don't know the true value of suffering until it's lost to us and not available to us. But the people of God have lost the right to worship Jesus and have lost the right to love him. When I go to Thailand, the children have absolute desperate to go to school. They don't all get the privilege. They don't all get the chance. They understand the value of an education. Here we might complain about going to school or going to college or wherever. But we don't realize the great privilege that it is. We take for granted suffering because it's in our lives all the time. And the same is true for us being able to gather openly like this to worship God. We need to remember to show gratitude and love to God because he's given us the ability to freely worship him. It's something we need to take for granted to go back to our good Lord and Father and to our opportunity. And we know that this is I, that worship is a distinctive, and I'm going to repeat some of the prophetic word that we recently had, so I'm going to make sure I say now and not just say now, but say it again in my own mind. We were told in our prophetic um, gathering that we had at Pioneer Conference that worship is a distinctive at City Life and God is promising to bring the whole City Life community is it I will find it into a new dimension of worship a fresh sound and with it greater revelation of who he is and he's raising up new worshippers who carry the anointing for fresh worship so I encourage us to declare these truths of our worship sing it with us today with all our might all our soul and all our strength because it's going to release greater freedom and greater empowerment to make it happen in our lives and in our society we have many freedoms compared to other societies but we also have many internal bondages the effects of selfishness stress brokenheartedness but whatever our areas of captivity whether they're external whether internal or both there's a few that are free now when Jesus is fulfilling his good purposes he is good news in his ears so we come to the next verse in the passage verse 22 which says this everyone spoke well of him this is the person who had read the word and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips how can this be they asked this is Joseph's son the passage tells us that everyone was amazed by Jesus' words and the grace they contained. There was such favor, there was such blessing, such goodness in the words and the way he said them. But all too quickly, some began to question their validity, to question the authority and the power based on Jesus' background. I mean, he's just a little carpenter. Suddenly, the best news that everyone's ever heard is undermined by their limited understanding of who he is because they're not sure they couldn't get their heads around it. And because they couldn't get their heads around it, they rejected Jesus and his message of freedom. When Jesus challenged them and said that the message would be given to others who would believe in him and who would receive his freedom, they were so offended and enraged that they tried to kill him. Because they hadn't heard the good news. So here we see hearts responding and receiving Jesus and his 
word and prayed for him kingdom and then mind undoing the, the good work. The lack of understanding becoming unbelief, uprooting and squashing the missing of faith and truth. And then turning into disobedience and disobedience. And this link between only believing what we can humanly understand rather than knowing what we know and what we know of. This mind versus spirit thing, I believe God's highlighted that in Paul recently in how he's you know, proclaimed it to people um, in the church at Corinth and around the world. In the last few weeks, I've had several conversations with different people, some of them believers for many years, others maybe not so long, and they've left me really troubled and really perplexed. They were either questioning God's word they were questioning his goodness or his sovereignty based on the fact that they didn't understand their situation or based on the fact they could no longer understand the Bible as the word of God because they determined it was going to be him they had to understand and didn't know. And I was concerned because then it means it seems as arbitrary based on what this person can understand and think rather than truth being an unchanging person called Jesus who we grow to understand increasingly with the help of the Holy Spirit as we seek to know him better. God says this about human understanding and the words we know. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Psalms 119, verse 26. My thoughts were nothing. Did you get agreement? It's all the baby's doing. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, says the Lord, says the Lord God to man. Now we've been created with a brain in this country. Some of us in here bigger ones than others, but that doesn't matter at all. The main thing that matters is that we receive impulses from the things we see, hear, touch, smell, and taste from the spinal cord. And they travel through the limbic system first, the felt emotion centers, until they reach the frontal lobe of the brain where logical thinking takes place. Heart responses occur before rational thinking takes place. That's how our brain works. That's why the people in Luke 4, 22, were initially moved and envisioned by Jesus' gracious words. logical understanding of him being a carpenter's son and actually ways of truth that he already was. If you want to um, find out a bit more of this, it's even from the point of view of understanding how our brains work and how things are used. It's quite a bit from the point of view of these two from heads we can box and unbox. And it's actually, I think, quite possible to see these independent thoughts show us how if we will understand that we are wired to an emotional response and a felt response to um, possibly what it is that we know or we need to be taught. And again, it's a question mark as to how that happens. So I have a hard enough time getting used to these kind of questions by just saying how. But it just shows that we need a revelation of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to understand Jesus more. We cannot rely on our own power to understand feels like a fearful thing to me when we let our understanding and knowledge determine who God is and what he's capable of. Because it's at best limiting. The worst case scenario will end up rejecting him, even after we personally experience his amazing correction. And there will be no difference in how we see him. And that's what we need to do. Of course, I'm not saying it's wrong to ask the Holy Spirit questions. Jesus spoke in parables, so we speak to him about him, and we speak to him 
Okay, you can hit the door and know loud. There are layers of revelation and freedom in God's word to discover over years and experience along the way round. I'm talking about the heart attitude to think and believe and act and understand God and to understand neighbour. And apart from the fact that that's impossible, it's also a surefire way to God and grow and be set free and help grow to be more like him. Are you still with me? Watchman Nee, a favourite of mine, spoke about the two C's in the Garden of Eden. The C of life and the C of knowledge of good and evil. Do you remember those? I think we should just call it quite simply the C of God. Because that's what it is. These C's ultimately represent two different sources of life, two different ways of living, and two different characters. Those of us who've read Genesis 1 to 3 know that mankind is encouraged to feed on the tree of life, which we see as the tree of spirit by the way, and told clearly to avoid eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because it would poison their lives and most surely bring them to death. Withers here reminded us of the death that we suffer when we're attracted and drew here, the five ugly faces of death, personal, relational, vocational, spiritual, and physical, all coming into our lives, ushered in by this tree when we came to know it. We know that mankind fell to the lies and the temptation of Satan, and they chose to live independently from God in the spirit realm. They assumed control and authority for their own lives and their world, through choosing to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, rather than rather than relating to God and the rest of the world. Why have knowledge or understanding of all that is good and evil when you can simply know it and live with it? And the person of Jesus on the tree knows it and lives with it. And it was a catastrophic result. Separation from God, who is love and life, and consequentially loss of peace, provision, protection, and what has become a fragile tree in the hands of the enemy. When mankind made their fatal choice, God put his redemption plan in place. Jesus fully human and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 3:23. Died crucified on another tree, carrying the curse of sin and death. The tree is also buttressed and set as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Redemption plan is aware of its weight and don't own it and don't deserve it and don't have to. But it's there to rescue us from our limited understanding and lack of freedom that we are in. And to offer us relationship with the one who is truth and love who gives us back that freedom. To live and thrive under his guidance, protection, provision and protocol. This is what Jesus was offering when he declared, I am the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. I am the tree of life and I cannot be broken. The redemptive plan in Jesus must be chosen. God offers and invites but does not force. He simply could be controlling. And he doesn't have anything to do with situations. He's chose got everything to do with the knowledge of good and evil. And so we live with it. And many of us have accepted that invitation in the new life of Jesus has begun. We know the work of grace. We've received. We only have to believe and receive the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for us in our lives. So here's the question Watchman Nee asked. Which tree do you now walk and thrive on? We know that the rescue plan and the salvation plan came from feeding on the tree of life, Jesus, the spirit. And to grow in relationship with God and experience his freedom from grace, we must continue to feed on the same fruit from this tree and live there. Some of us receive our salvation in Jesus and then we stray back to the tree of knowledge and good and evil to try and live it out. Instead of living by the flow of the spirit life and the grace within us, we live by opinions regarding good and evil, right and wrong, as we will. It makes for a difficult journey because it means we start doing things in our own strength and through our own understanding and once again it excludes 
I want any darkness in my life gone and I want it back. And I just lift you up to the Father and I ask you to just fill that new place of my heart. And I pray in your holy name. Amen. Can we bow our heads? Amen. Thanks, Beth. That's our appreciation.